And that is about it for me. And I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. I love groups this size because we can kind of have conversations. So yeah, jump in if you if you have a question or comment or anything. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen and we can run away with this thing. Okay, does everybody see that? Great. All right, well, I always wanna start here when I start a talk because this was kind of the most significant pivot point in my career. Um, when I started graduate school, which has been yikes, 15 years ago or something now, um, on day two of graduate school, I found myself in a very sudden and an unexpected divorce. Um, and it, it, the, the floor just dropped out from under me. You know, I, I had all these plans and all these schemes and everything ready to go. And I just couldn't make work. I couldn't do anything. I just kind of froze. And so, you know, at the time I was mostly doing photography. So I, I decided just, I'll, I'll take a weaving class. I'll take a pottery class. I just, I just need to go do something therapeutic. So I took a Pueblo pottery class with this master Pueblo potter named Clarence Cruz. And it was just what I needed. Uh, we, we went out and we dug the clay out of the earth and then we soaked the clay, we sifted the clay and we cleaned the clay. And then we let it set for a week. And it was this long and beautiful, arduous process of making. Once we had the clay in our hands, we were to breathe our spirit into the vessel before we started coiling the pot. We coiled the pots, you know, coil by coil by coil, and then you smooth them out with your fingers to make them beautiful. And it was so much about touch and breath and, and even your very DNA being embedded in that pot. And so it felt like a new start for me. I made this this beautiful thing, and we went out to Santa Fe one afternoon to to fire them in these huge um, earthen kilns with with fire uh, all around. And so I'd made this thing. I poured my spirit into it, and I put it into the kiln lovingly, and closed it up, and waited for a couple of hours. And we fired them. We opened the top after this, and everyone's pots were in there beautifully fired except for mine and mine was in a hundred pieces didn't survive the firing and at that moment I remember just falling to my knees and weeping because it was I put so much into that thing that I thought was the thing that was pulling me out of the gutter <laughs> and the instructor came over to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said it's okay he started to pull up the pieces he said let's let's take the pieces and bury them and give them back to the earth. And this is the time for you to start over. And I said, I will, I will start over. And I did. So I love this quote that says something very beautiful happens to people when their world has fallen apart. A humility, a nobility, a higher intelligence emerges at the point when our knees hit the floor. So that happened in life, it happened in the studio. Um, I went back into my studio the day after that happened, and I, I saw these two chairs that I had rescued from the side of the road in Boston on my way to New Mexico to start graduate school. I'm a big rescuer of things and have this idea still from childhood that objects have human qualities and human emotions. So there were these two broken chairs that someone had thrown out, and I felt sorry for them. So I picked them up and stuck them in the moving truck and brought them all the way to, Al to Albuquerque. And there they were sitting in my studio looking at me. And so I started tearing some cloth that I had in the studio and bandaging these chairs, just one strip at a time, very methodically, ritualistically, I would bathe the strip of cloth in water and then wrap it around the chair. And it made this beautiful musty smell and there was some therapy. It was very cathartic. To, to wrap these things one by one by one. So I wrapped the chairs and then I wrapped the table that went with the chairs and then eventually started wrapping the walls of the studio. And over the course of six months, this is all I did. And the studio was just wrap things in bandages and bandages in this effort to sort of heal them or make them feel seen or beautiful again. And so after that was over, I made one photograph 
and this was that. And then the very next day, here's some close ups of it. It looked like this. And so that was my way of starting over. And what that taught me was that, you know, the process that I had had come to graduate school with, which was sitting behind the computer and taking elements that I had photographed one by one and making digital composites wasn't wasn't where my heart was anymore. I wanted to make things with my hands and touch and feel and breathe into things and feel like I could build something up and maybe reduce it down with the camera. So it changed everything, the way I was thinking about making work. So we'll rewind a little bit and I'll show you kind of where I started way back when. <laughs> Um, when I very first started making photographs, I did portraiture and a lot of kind of what you might consider fashion um, editorial uh, stylistically, but um, what's happening? Yes, I know. Oh. oh, so when someone tries to enter the waiting room, it freezes my screen, guys. So, uh oh, there we go. Did that work? So right, um, I was doing kind of women's portraiture or um, sort of the fine art edge on portraiture. Uh, and what I loved about it was the, the element of self-expression that I could sort of put my own life experience into these portraits of other women and, you know, try to, I guess, embody that, um, that idea of, of coming of age or womanhood or, or any of those things. So it started here and see, there's my bandages. These things just stick with you, don't they? And shortly after that, I started to want that and really crave that idea of self-expression and, and, and putting maybe narratives into the work and, and my own, you know, stories. So this was the first series I made that was explicitly like a series of photographs. I called it Traveler. Uh, and I just made these very simple digital composites um, where I would photograph a, a person in the studio and, you know, objects. At this point, they were just objects. This came from Pottery Barn um, that I photographed um, in, in the studio and then put together uh, digitally. So they're just simple, but they were thrilling to me at the time because I could, I had this new sort of, I guess, power of, of putting something together that was surreal and, and it had a, a new, fresh look to it from what I was doing before. The next series I made was something called Baptism. And so this was a, a series of 10 photographs. And this is where I really started thinking about um, putting the issues that sort of stick with me and haunt me and, and, and cloud my brain all the time into my work um, and in particular my feelings about religion my southern baptist upbringing um, how faith plays a role in the human experience how faith plays a role in the way our moral code the way we treat one another everything um, and so this was a narrative series about um, the act of baptism and the, the steps that were required in the southern baptist church to become baptized. This one's called prayer machine. So I was imagining this, you know, ridiculous structure that was necessary in order to speak to God. There were all these kind of sort of steps. So it was almost like a, a prog progressive series about what it took to become baptized in the, in the church. So it was just, again, photographing in this case, mostly car refuse, car parts and things that were uh, discarded and unusable. Uh, and then digitally composing them together to make these kind of surreal uh, images, photographs. And so I made a set of bromoil prints of these, believe it or not, which I don't think I can ever do again. Um, and this was my first exhibition at the Reiko Center photography this is in uh, San Francisco and nobody told me to wear black and look sad so I de definitely stood out um while I was in San Francisco um I visited Alcatraz has anybody ever been there such an interesting place and I had my camera with me and I just kind of missed the boat back 
<laughs> to the city like four times and stayed there all day and, and made photographs. And I didn't necessarily know why I was making these photographs, but I knew these things were interesting to me. So I made pictures of the flora mostly because the idea that these things, you know, the root systems of these plants were there when the prisoners were there. And, and in fact, the, the prisoners even tended some of these the plants while they were incarcerated there. So I, I thought of them as witnesses to what had happened and I made photographs of them. Also I made photographs of hardware and um, bits and pieces, things that I could find that felt relevant. Again, I didn't know what I was gonna do with any of it, but eventually it turned into a series of five photographs, particularly about um, growing up a, a young girl in the Southern Baptist Church and how it felt to sort of be maybe second in line or, or to feel small and decorative and um, not have the same rights and privileges as the men. So I made these tiny little icons. These prints are like 10 inches tall. They're very small. So they kind of feel like the little crucifix you might put above your bed, but very precious and tiny little dolls. So this is the same process of digital collage and um, compositing. And these, the labor involved was just unreal because I mean, I was, I was selecting every leaf of a plant, you know, by hand in Photoshop. And I look back at that now and, you know, I see that, that hand in there thinking, you know, it's the same hand. It's just now it's, it's, it's pulling wool or it's making a weaving or something like that. So then I was able to secure a, I think a six week long residency at the Santa Fe Art Institute here in New Mexico. I was living in Boston at the time, uh, but they gave me a wonderful studio space and a lot of time to work. And so this was the first opportunity I had to build myself an actual set. And, you know, it's something I always wanted to do. So I brought in the materials and built myself a room. Um, which then I coated in this kind of thick mixture of paint and, and concrete and sand to make it look kind of like a, a cell. And then back then, there was this wonderful place out in Los Alamos called the Black Hole, if you've ever heard of it. Um, it was acres and acres of military surplus and atomic surplus. So I went out and made a, a deal with the guy who owned the place and said, can I borrow this stuff uh, for a fee? Uh, and you know, bring it back. And he said, sure. So he let me take four or five fan loads full of crazy stuff back to the studio. And I made um, makeshift sculptures with them. So this was the first time I was really able to, to use my, my sculpture hand and make assemblages. And you know, I couldn't necessarily weld something together or even glue something together. Um, so I made these kind of half, half sculpture, half digital collage images where I could, you know, where I could, where things fit and I could stick things together with tape, uh, I did. And where I couldn't, I, I pulled things in digitally and composited them like I did before. So the series was called Medic and it had to do with um, a neurological condition that I had at the time that nobody could figure out. I'd been to, I don't know how many doctors, uh, first maybe it was MS and then maybe it was brain tumor and I was 20 something. Uh, maybe 30, right at 30. And nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. So the series is really a, a, a collection of machines that could diagnose or, you know, figure out the answer to the problem. Or maybe um, they could tick a box, like when someone is terminally ill, uh, what do they need? What do they want? Um, they want to record their memories. They want to have a legacy. So these machines are able to do these things for people. I interviewed people a lot about their own experiences with medical trauma. And um, this particular image is based on a story from a young mother whose son was in a coma for like, I don't know, a couple of years. <clears throat> and she said she would write him letters, handwritten letters, and put them under his pillow at night. And she believed that he could read them while he was sleeping. And I loved that story. I still love that story. And so this one is my version of of that. So there were 10 of these. Each machine had its own sort of magical function. Extracting pain, perhaps. 
So this was my first monograph. This was published by Photo Lucida in 2013, I think. Um, and it was a, a lovely combination of these handwritten letters, which were prose that I had written out. And then I had friends and family do the handwriting. And I scanned the letters and paired each image with a letter that would tell you a little bit about what was happening in the photograph. So again, there's this thing sort of knocking on my door all the time, this inexhaustible question of faith, and not just the faith I was raised with, but just faith in general and belief and how you know that profoundly affects the way we live our lives. For instance, if, if you believe in an afterlife, does that affect the choices you make here? If you don't, and this is it, then does that affect the choices you make here? All of these things have this wonderful interplay with, you know, belief has this wonderful interplay with, with the way we, we exist and the way we relate to each other. So after I made the fabric room, which I showed you at the beginning of this, um, this was my second year and third year in graduate school, I started just gathering things. I didn't want to sit behind the computer and make digital composites anymore. I just wanted to touch things and make things with my hands. So I started just gathering stuff. I had taken a weaving class and fallen in love with fiber and wool and all things spinning and weaving and all of the stuff, right? So I brought in a lot of fiber and wool, like this is entire wool fleece. Uh, I wove this blanket out of uh, sheep's churro, churro wool, which is local here to New Mexico, and human hair. And it made this really, really interesting uh, metaphor between the, the sheep and, and the human and the, the biblical message that's woven in there about people being referred to as sheep so many times in the Bible. That was really, really interesting to me and really inspiring to me to be able to take a material and use it symbolically. Uh, like I made these out of a porcelain clay and, you know, I, again, this, it was these meditations, just like ripping the bandages, hundreds and maybe thousands of bandages. I love the process of repetitive, meditative, sort of ritualistic making. Um, in this case, I was just rolling little marbles, you know, quarter size balls and flattening, rolling, flattening, rolling, flattening thousands of times. And they looked like communion wafers to me. So... Um, there's just all of these, I guess, opportunities, new opportunities that were really exciting to me because I was newly discovering how to make, how to use a material, how to touch something, how to create something, and then, and then photograph it. So this is a giant wool sculpture that I was needle felting out of red wool that I dyed myself. It was a really beautiful time in the studio because everything was magical. Um, this is also wool roving. You can see there's just lots of experiments and you know, I did wax and latex and just everything I could get my hands on. I made these latex casts of these little seed pods um, that looked quite fleshy. They looked like my own skin, which I found really interesting. And so, you know, what to do with the things? I didn't know yet. It was it just kind of a, I'll make the stuff and then I'll figure it out. And that that element of making had changed so much because when I made digital composites, I had to have a, a plan and a plan that was executed to the minute you know to the line like I had to photograph a, a tin can in a certain way because the light had to be consistent with the rest of the scene so I had a map for every photograph this was I turned that on its head it was just I'll make something play with it and then see what it's going to end up like in a photograph these were as a, as a kid, I was, and I'm still terrified of balloons. I hate them. I hate the, the, the idea that they're just going to pop any second, and I can't stand loud sudden noises. So I took this little anxiety, and I, I don't know, I made thousands of these, just filled them with sand, and they looked like little leeches or something. Um, interesting. I played with plaster. and So I had, had all these objects, and I was, again, thinking about, in this case, sort of um, religious trauma and how my own anxiety and, and depression have, you know, a connection to that religious trauma. I started to research that and found that it's very common. Uh, I, I read a lot of stories. I did a lot of deep research about the relationship between anxiety, depression, and religious upbringings. And so this work wanted to be about that. Um, and so I sought out house that I wanted to be as close a replica to my childhood home 
as possible. And so I looked all over Albuquerque. Now I had a grant, um, the Howard Franks Memorial Scholarship was $10,000 grant to do this. And so I found this house that felt very much, very much like the house I grew up in. And I just rented it for a year. So I had this sort of makeshift studio um, exhibition space that I just got to play in for a year. And when I first walked in, I, I just felt like this place was talking to me. And I made these, these are just from my iPhone, but it was like a conversation between me and every room, the light that was coming through and the way it smelled. And you could even see little dust particles in the sun rays. And it just felt like this, this is it. So I signed the lease. I had the place for a year. And I wanted to somehow bring my objects into this space and make a body of work. Um, so I had the three, you know, I had the place, I had the objects, and I had the idea. I knew I wanted it to be something about anxiety and religious trauma. So I started bringing things in and pairing them with human subjects, um, which is something I still love to do. Um, and so I ended up with 12 photographs. I used every room of the house. And this is the series. This one's called Cancer. So I brought in also objects from my childhood home and like the very same alarm clock that I had in my bedroom and this very same glasses my dad wore and even books that we had on our bookshelves and medications and China and the wooden fruit that was on the TV shelf in our, in our living room. And so I wanted to mix with the beautiful parts of my childhood, the things that were magical and wonderful. And I mean, my parents are doting, loving, loving people. And I'm so thankful <laughs> for my upbringing. Um, and then I wanted to also approach how I felt, um, you know, I'm some really quite terrified growing up, um, fearing, fearing hell and, and all of the things that come with sort of eternal conscious punishment if one doesn't take the right steps in the right way. So it's about both of those things uh, and, and the strange relationship between those things and the balance. It was an interesting discovery, I think, to, to bring the sculptures in and have people performing with them, really interacting with them, where, you know, before I was making the sort of sculpture or the, the, the apparatus after the person was in the room. So it was very different to have people actually in the space, wearing the things, touching the things, interacting with them. It was very magical to see that because people brought their own experience, they brought their own fears, their own anxieties, their own discomfort, and, and it, you know, it's part of the story, it multiplied the effect. My own family came up from Texas for this one. This is my cousin and her four boys. We're all practically married now, which is, wow. So I had the initial exhibition of Testament in the house. This was my thesis exhibition for graduate school. So I put the photographs on the wall in the house and lit them. And then accompanying those photographs were small installation pieces and sculptures that had you know these rich sort of religious symbols attached to inform the photographs that were in the room. I also love the idea of this, um, the thread in the Bible about death and resurrection, which you see, and of course the crucifixion, but many other stories as well. And so in materials, I was interested in trying to, to, to show that, to make that, that picture. Um, so like here, these two wolf fleeces that were in this photograph, I repurposed um, to make this woman, this pregnant woman. So it's the same wool fleeces. I just um, use them in a new way. So it's kind of like something dying and being reborn, right? At the time, so I met my husband here while I was in graduate school and we were struggling with infertility. And so this is just, uh, I wanted this that in there. I needed that part of life to be in the story. So here's our two our two fetuses that we lost. 
I brought the wool fleeces into the kitchen, the, the filthy, dirty wool fleeces. And when you walked in here, you, you could smell. It smelled like a, a barnyard, which was sort of this, this conflicting experience. The, the kitchen is meant to be one of the cleanest rooms in the house. And, uh, it made the whole, the whole house sort of feel like, almost like a stable or even like a little, what, what am I trying to think? I'm losing my, where was Jesus born? in a manger there we go manger <laughs> so anyway the uh the red uh massive tumor here that was needle felted for this piece i repurposed into these i spun it into yarn where i could and then i refelted it into these hands and uh since the yarn and the, the wool was hand dyed it leached out this this color into this water over the course of the the, the, the evening or the opening is as long as the exhibition was open and the water became redder and redder. I had taken pottery classes and learned how to glaze pottery and so I made these bowls. It was just play, really. I, everything that I had learned how to do in graduate school, I got to, I got to try on and uh, I made these fish out of latex and put bladders inside. And so over the course of the exhibition, they would leak water onto the bed, which I think looks, you know, a lot like menstrual blood or afterbirth. <clears throat> The, the wool here on the legs, um, I wove into this blanket. In the bathtub, I had milk and honey. So every room in the house was sort of freighted or employed. It was, it was doing something. Um, and you know, there was a certain order that people tended to follow. They would go into the right bedroom first and then the back right and then the left. And so it was kind of this, narrative that unfolded as you walked through the house. This is, I think, my favorite object I made for the installation. There are these little goats and sheep. There's a verse in the Bible about the, go the goats and the sheep and that the goats will be flung into hell, basically, and that the sheep are the good followers. And I always feel like, well, I'm goat, right? Um, so I made these little creatures with, uh, you can't see it quite well there, but they have their insides on their outsides. Um, a little herd of them, 33 of each. So after I finished that exhibition, um, I took one element from every sculpture and put it into a jar and sealed it and buried it under the foundation of the house because I think it will always be with me and now I'll always be with it. So a few years later, uh, COVID struck and we had two little boys, uh, our infertility journey finally ended. Um, and so, you know, under lockdown, um, I just did a lot of playing uh, with things that I had in the house. So I, this was in particularly sort of about the COVID experience, like we couldn't get bread, um, we couldn't get milk, we couldn't get meat. So what I did was use sort of other materials to replace things we couldn't get. In this case, uh, felted wool, um, I made ground beef out of the felted wool. Um, I think my favorite thing I made during the lockdown were these, um, which I'm calling retired objects, uh, where I took things that are high touch objects from the, our home that no longer served us. They were no longer working or we no longer used them. But things that were, were sort of companions for years and years, you know, and they grow old just like people do. They start to show signs of wear and tear and you see fingerprints and, and build up on them. And they serve us sort of lovingly all this time. And then we, we tend to just throw things away. And again, there comes my idea that these things do have feelings and that they hold human energy and they hold memory. And so I took these objects and bandaged them. So it's, it's derivative of the, the Lamentations project I showed you at the very beginning. I still wanna bandage things. I think I always will. Um, so I did this hair dryer and I, I hand wove these blankets to go underneath them. And I handmade the little wooden boxes that you see under them, like a burial ritual for each object. And there's my my phone, especially uh, phones fascinate me because they're so, they're an extension of our body. And then we just trade them in or we throw them away. And uh, it's such a, a strange thing to do to me to have something so close and then just discard it. And then these scissors that were no longer useful. Um, so I, I wanna make more of these. I, 
I have a whole pile of objects in a box in the garage that I that I'm working on. So also during lockdown, I made these, these baby clothes, which was this weird departure for me. But at the time, you know, my anxiety was especially high because I had two little kids and there was a global pandemic that nobody understood. My eight-year-old, I guess, was four at the time, maybe five, four, five. Um, he, you know, from the limited news coverage that he was seeing, kept seeing images of the coronavirus and he was scared and he started to draw it um, obsessively. So these are his drawings of the COVID virus that I scanned and then put onto these, his baby clothes uh, as a way of sort of coping with my own anxiety about this disease that was coming for us. Um, and then there were these other questions that came up with COVID, like a, a human being essential, a human being non-essential. And the strange things happen when you put those terms onto a, a baby, literally on their chest. Um, it, it sort of shifts the meaning of what that is, uh, these sort of tags and labels that we assign to each other. Um, and so just lately, actually over just the past month, I was thinking about those COVID baby clothes and um, this issue, the, the issue of immigration is extremely heavy on my heart and it, it relates very closely to those questions I have about faith and how faith plays a role in ethics and humanity and the way that we treat one another. And, you know, there's a direct, for me, disconnect between the Christian faith, faith or evangelical faith I was raised with and the way that that people group is treating or, or viewing immigrants. So I wanted to make work about that, that question, like, where's our humanity? So I made these baby clothes um, re regarding those issues. So we have like a, a swimsuit with a pattern of razor wire on it, or the border patrol set for a little boy with handcuffs on the shorts. And so the idea is I, I want people to picture their own children in these clothing, these clothing, items of clothing, and think, this is not okay. This is not okay for my children. So why is it okay for their children is the question I'm posing. These are really new and I don't know how I feel about them yet. I'm sharing them with you very timidly because I, I, I'm still, you know, still learning about them and learning how to think about them. But I think they're interesting. And I, what I would really like to do is, is make the clothing in different sizes and actually have an exhibition, an installation where it, it looks like a boutique um, where you see all the clothing on little hangers in different sizes, just like you would in a high-end children's boutique. So we have on the left, they're like drug mule, which, you know, I, I hear all the time that is an excuse. Um, well, they're all drug mules or, you know, you put that on a, a newborn baby and it suddenly it takes on a, not a new meaning, but a tougher meaning somehow. I'm also really interested in this idea that, you know, evangelicals that I was raised with anyway, view babies um, as perhaps more valuable or there's a certain innocence or preciousness or mir miraculous you know but only some babies it seems um, and we have build the wall on the left and a rear razor wire um, snuggle suit on the right so i'm just trying to, to i don't know use sort of a dark dark sarcasm i guess to, to point to these issues Again, I, I don't know how I feel about them yet, but maybe you can tell me since they're literally days old. Um, I'm also working on a, another large project I'll share with you at the end about um, gun violence, particularly in schools, um, school shootings. And so I have another line of baby clothes here that I'm starting um, that targets that issue. I mean, and they, I mean, I've got little kids. I've got little kids that go to school, and the thought of putting this on their body, you know, is horrifying. And I hope horrifying for anyone who views them enough to make us at least pause and and think again about what's happening. We have, you know, gun worship and glorification of of weapons and also violence. So anyway, those are just a few ramblings that I wanted to share with you. Um, so after COVID, I feel like, I don't know if you agree, 
there was sort of this uprising of a new sort of brighter humanity that that emerged where people started for a while maybe seeing each other a little more you know caring for each other a little more um, seeing each other's humanity so I, I i did this experimental project where i i asked on social media for any volunteer to offer prayer for a total stranger in any method any religion any you could be an atheist, you could be anything you want. You can offer someone a blessing, you can offer someone a mantra. But the idea is just to offer kindness, really, to another human using your system of belief. And so what I did was just collect names and put names in a jar, and then draw two names, pair up two people, and meet at one of their homes. And they performed these prayers for one another. And which this is really different for me because I'm not a documentary photographer usually, but I just sat back and tried to document what was happening without interacting or interfering. And, you know, these really beautiful moments emerge where people, I mean, these are total strangers, are sort of caught caring for one another in a photograph. And I, mean, I was moved to tears several times that people were sharing things, hugging one another, you know, crying, um, confessing things, um, sharing really personal, intimate stories. Something happened in those rooms where people, there was a sort of a, a curtain that was dropped and there was a, an odd trust that happened only for an hour and then it was gone. And so documenting that photographically was really a privilege and I'm still making these uh, as people volunteer. I just pair them up and go to people's homes and make photographs. So where I'm interested in, in where you know faith and religion are are destructive in society, I'm also really interested in where they're not and where there's really humanitarianism beauty in them. So toward the you know I've, I'll back up a bit um, toward the end of COVID. Did anybody wash their groceries? Because I totally washed my groceries. I was terrified. There was one afternoon here where I was I was washing my groceries and I had these rubber gloves on and I my anxiety you know was over the top at the time that I was staving off panic attacks daily and what I do when I stave off a panic attack is I mark make so I'll take um, a paintbrush and paint or an ink pen or something and just make tally marks to calm myself down I have a breathing ritual I do and so that afternoon I had my gloves on and the kids were painting so I just sat with them and made these marks on this glove um, as a way of calming myself. And with every little mark, I said, God protect my children, God protect my children, God protect my children, over and over like a mantra. And it calmed me. And so that sat with me for a while. And I thought, you know, this thing that I've made is kind of beautiful. And um, I don't know, it had the gesture of the hand still when I took it off and I liked it. So I made one that was cotton to see how it felt. And it felt wonderful. And I thought, what if other people might want to do this? for someone, you know, uh, uh, offer their prayers for someone who needs them and, and do this and the same ritual. So as an experiment, truly at the beginning, I just put a call on social media and said, does anybody want to be the recipient of random people's prayers from all over the world? Prayers, mantras, attitudes, positive thoughts, whatever. And within the first two minutes, I had this family, uh, this little boy volunteer and say, we have this little boy who's four who's suffering from a terrible seizure disorder and we would love to be the recipient of positive thoughts and prayers from around the world. So I said yes, and off we went. Um, and so I, I did this massive social media campaign and, you know, hired people to help me get the word out um, where and distributed these gloves that people could do exactly what I had done, mark them while thinking about this little boy in whatever way that they wanted to think about him, and then send me those gloves as evidence of that time that they spent and thought for him. And so <laughs> at first it was slow, and then it wasn't. And I was getting boxes and boxes and boxes every day um, from all over the world, from Japan, <laughs> boxes from, I think there were, I don't know, 13, 12, 13 different countries. Um, so I ended up with 2,080 gloves in the end from all over the world. 
And so I took the gloves uh, once they had been marked and I dyed them with these beautiful medicinal pigments. Uh, the pigment itself is a, med a medicine, which I love the symbolism of, and it rendered this gorgeous kind of rusty red color. I cast all the gloves on these wooden molds to give them shape. So every single one, <laughs> and I love that because every single one was touched, every single one was handled, every single one was seen and felt uh, in the studio and, and appreciated, which just, it, there's a root in that process for me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I collected them over the course of about a year and a half and cast them. And then uh, I, I was able to secure this decommissioned chapel in Santa Fe for less than, it was less than two weeks uh, to install this piece. So I suspended all of them from the, the ceiling of this chapel. I'll show you the video here, of the, the documentation of the installation, and then we can talk a bit more about it. All right, so here's the photograph. Um, I made just just one really um, photograph of it all put together with, with little Caspian, the boy who was the recipient of all the prayers in the photograph. He was able to come with his family and spend some time inside the installation. And it was a magical thing to watch because he, he just loved it. He's a sensory kid and he wanted to touch everything. And he started to dance and he started to sing and his mother, her eyes were just flooded with tears. And I said, is everything okay? And she said, yes, we haven't seen him sing like that in years. So it was really a beautiful moment to, to witness. Some close-ups of that same image. I used olive branches. Again, I'm really interested in you know symbolism, especially like uh, religious symbolism. Uh, I wove this blanket and hand stamped it. Everything has a hand and everything has my hand in it. Everything is touched. Well, I guess I made two photographs tonight. There's that one. I also made some portraits of him in a nearby room in the same chapel. I painted the walls in this little parlor blue and hand stamped this pattern on the wall. We brought in all these fresh flowers and mix them with uh, flora that we found just surrounding the, the grounds of the chapel. And I made this sort of altar. <clears throat> I made this one and here's a closer one. This is called Daily Bread. And here's another portrait. 
And then I included some of these so you could see the remarkable thought that was put into these gloves from people all over the world. They're also different and so beautiful. It was really, truly thrilling to get these in the mail and to see what people had done. Some people were stamping and some people were writing messages and all kinds of different things. Even we have, I think, Jesus and his disciples on our PSL portrait. So interesting. I loved these that say, you are not alone, dear boy. So I photographed every single pair um, just to document that wonderful variety. And uh, these could be an exhibition just like basically like this. Um, I'm printing these at 10 by 10 inches on uh, a washi paper that is very fragile and you can sort of see through it. And then as you walk by it, it flutters. So it's just kind of, I don't know, what's the word? Um, What's the word that starts with E that means temporary? The good art word, whatever it is, somebody will think of it. Um, ephemeral, <laughs> ephemeral, uh, they're very ephemeral. So what am I doing now? Um, is that, are we doing okay? Yeah, um, I'm learning to make braids. Uh, so I, there's a lovely lady here and, and Albuquerque, who is a, a master brick maker, and she gave me lessons on how to make Adobe bricks. And so I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in a project. I'm, I'm starting a project now on the topic of um, school shootings. And so what I'm doing, experimenting with right now, uh, is collecting soil from different regions to make bricks and include that soil as part of the makeup of the brick. Um, and so what I want to do is have representatives or go myself to every site of every single school shooting that's ever happened here in the United States, and there are hundreds of them, and dig up just a handful of soil from each site, maybe a bucket of soil from each site, and make bricks uh, uh, using that soil. So every school will be represented in a series of bricks. One brick will represent 100 students that were exposed to that event in that school. So some of the schools might have 50 bricks, some of the schools might have 20, some might have two. Uh, but the idea is that I'll have hundreds, thousands, couple thousand of these bricks um, from all over the, the country. And then what I wanna do is build with those bricks, a replica of the very first ever schoolhouse, which was in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and on the outside, um, you see, if you look closely, you can see little shoes. Uh, I want to bronze shoes um, to represent every fatality. So there have been 280, I believe, date fatalities. And so there will be a pair of shoes representing every fatality um, on the outside. And on the inside, you'll see a few things, um, a school desk, uh, a sculpture of a, a sheep, a, a little lamb underneath the school desk cowering under there. A reflecting pool made of salt water and then salt for people to walk around it and leave friends. And then maybe most importantly, there will be a microphone there um, for anybody under the age of 18, uh, American citizens that are not, uh, to speak and to be heard. Um, they can have the option to record or not, but regardless, their voice will be heard throughout the room about how they feel about what's happening in, in schools right now. And so that can be sort of a running record of, of voices and a collection of voices. So this is what I'm working on right now. I'm I'm working on getting funding for it right now is what's happening. But um, this is my dream project that I'm, I'm hoping to see as a real thing, maybe in the next two or three years. So that is that is it. Here's if you want to find me, please do uh, connect. You feel free to reach out via email or or anything. All my information's there. And that's it tonight. Thank you all so much for your attention and for coming. Appreciate you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hey, thank you very yeah. much, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> before we get to the questions, I've been following Jennifer since the early composite work. <laughs> um, so it's, I don't know, 12 years? Uh, more, maybe 15, 15, 16 years. Yeah, yeah probably 15 years. Um, and just watching her grow each time. And it's been a wonderful journey for me too. 
But anyway, does anyone have any questions for Jennifer? Well, um, I, I have uh, never seen um, projects or an artist who has put their literally their heart and soul into the work that they've done as, 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 that you've done. I mean, if your your work's incredible, and uh, uh, you can see that you're very committed to it, and it's very touching. Um, mm. So I, I I thoroughly enjoyed this and your presentation. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear. Yeah, I don't I don't have a question per se, but I just want to say I believe that you I, I, I for a while I subscribed to a thing called Creative Live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they uh they had a session on there. I think it was you that taught it. It was and it was about uh it was I think you were using my had models at the time and were taking pictures of of them in all kinds of interesting environments and positions and yeah. And, I found that really fascinating, and I think you you also had a there was a, there was a time when you you talked in that thing about the period where you felt that you didn't have where you felt blocked. And yeah. There was a a talk about well you know it's a, it's a time to take a year and just spin around, mm -hmm. wait till something arrives. And I was very I was inspired by that. I just inspired by the whole thing, and I I just seeing what your creative journey has led you to is really quite quite remarkable. Thank you so much. Yeah, I distinctly remember that that period of feeling kind of stuck or yeah, and really it's it's a how do how do you I don't know that I truly even believe anymore in being stuck. It's more just a rhythm that that is healthy and necessary. Um where there are times where everything is coming all at once and there are millions of ideas and, and so many that you can't even feel them all. And then there are times where you are quiet, you know, and those are the times where you collect. That's the, the kind of time now where I just start going and bringing materials into the studio and waiting for them to tell me what to do with them. You know, what can I put my hands on? But um, yeah, and I learned more and more every project about that rhythm. And, you know, I've learned to really love it and appreciate it. So it's cool that you brought that up because I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was, it was a very, it was a very, it was a wonderful, wonderful course. And Thanks. I, just, I just joined the center uh, like a week ago, and I'm, I'm already benefiting from it. This is, this is one oh. of talk. Awesome. So, thanks, everybody. You know, your work is really an intersection between art and politics, and, yeah. um, and it's, uh, but it's, it's such an un, a unique take on it. You know, you're you're um, applying it to children and that you know can be a very sensitive subject for a lot of people they feel very protective about what children can take in and you're um, you're asking people to take a look um, you know I, how did you say it if if it's not okay for my children why is it okay for anyone else and and I think that is a a pretty uh, significant statement and um it, yeah and, and the detail that you bring to it the photographing of individual um gloves that were sent in and yeah it i can see it, this tells me so much about you and you know in terms of the photography i you know you're matching it to your vision but it's really to me more about you than it is about art in a way but yeah it is. yeah thank you for that like i mean i teach a lot of classes just um private classes with 10 15 people at a time and that's what we talk about is trying to figure out this this sort of method of pouring your own memory and life experience and even personality and your neuroses and your habits and all the things mm -hmm. you know and the more I learn about all those things like like my bookshelf has everything has to be perfectly straight and when I look at my photographs everything has to be perfectly straight there's a relationship between all parts of our brain and the way that we make it if we can tap into all those things it richens the work it gives it so many more layers of meaning and richness when we are able to do that but I'm still learning and that's a lifelong process. Um, but it, it just means a lot that you can you can see that. That's great to hear. Thank you. 
Okay, does, <clears throat> excuse me, does anyone else have anything for Jennifer? Wonderful work, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, yeah, Jennifer, absolutely Hi. wonderful work. Um, thank you for, for showing it and taking us through your thinking on everything, which is just so interesting. Um, do you see, uh, I, this might be a, a moot point at this stage, but from your earlier work, I thought, I wondered what you thought of AI and um, you know what you could have done with it back then, um, but does it, does it have any place or what are your thoughts on that um, with your work now or going into the future? How do yeah. you it's a double-edged sword. The, the idea of sourcing images, <clears throat> especially sort of images that are not pure images um, per se, doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I think that's wonderful. In, in conceptual art, I mean, it, it's it's much less about the actual fabrication of the object often and a much more about the ideas. So the method of making maybe is, is less important in a lot of ways. Um, so where do the images come from? What's the source? I say, great. I, I, the other part of it, though, is that we have artists losing their livelihoods and their jobs because they're no longer needed or necessary in, in their industries. So that's that's terrible. And so, that yeah, but it, the idea of somebody, an artist using AI to, to make their work, I'm all for it. Um, but, and I don't know what I would have done at the time. I was a I had this idea that everything had to be pure then, that I had to make the photograph. I wouldn't use stock images or anything even then. Um, so then I probably would not have, have used it. Now I might um, be more interested in it. I thought about it with the, the baby clothes. In, in fact, like I couldn't quite pull the trigger because I just felt like it, I don't know, it just felt inauthentic somehow to, to do that, but I don't, I don't judge it. <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know, just one more comment on the baby clothes. They're like the t-shirts. You know, t-shirts are political statements. And that's what Absolutely. yeah, the baby clothes are, except they're on babies. Yeah. And the baby isn't making the statement, the parent is, because the baby is unaware. Exactly. And I think I find that so interesting because we project so many ideas onto our kids and, and culturally and personally um but somehow it's more disturbing when we see those ideas projected onto a little body um it's it's more jarring it's more terrifying to think of the sort of continuation of these problems perhaps i mean those clothes and i'm, I'm making more but are on both sides of the argument some some of uh, on the side of the oppressor, perhaps like the border patrol one, and some on the side of the oppressed, like the the razor wire bathing suit. Um, either one is not okay <laughs> for a child, right? Um, so why is it okay for us? Why is it okay? It's, it raises all kinds of strange questions, and and it's especially triggering somehow when a child is the the brand, the wearer of these things. And that that alone is so interesting to me why things are so much more freighted when a child is wearing them because that's a cultural thing too it's interesting yeah, and, and i i could see where you would be um a target you know by people who uh feel that you're exploiting children you know, sure yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You know, the whole woke argument and why are you you know, and the whole anti why people are banning books, you know, because they are afraid of um, exposing children to any kind of um, uh, uncomfortable idea. Critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm ready for that. Uh, but it, it, it'll be, it'll be surprising no matter what, you know, how people, <laughs> you know, I want to be really careful. I, I don't want to put them on anybody necessarily oh. you know the photographs will be just the clothing and so that it's the job of the viewer to, to figure out who's wearing them what is the child who's the child i i'm not doing that um the viewer does that part and i think leaving the onus of that bit on the viewer is what 
I guess puts up that's the line that's the line I'm trying not to cross right there and then I'm really close to a line but just yeah. just doing it right so I think but it's so new I, I'm still trying to figure all that out so I appreciate your 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 read on it well thank you sure thing. <clears throat> excuse me again if nobody else has anything we'll call it a night um, thank you again for coming and thanks Jennifer for being here yeah. and we're taking off in December because the third Thursday is just about Christmas uh, but we'll be back January 18 I hope to see you all then thank you thank you Th uh, thank you Jennifer for thank you everyone thank, thank you Jennifer thank you Michael thank you. thank you thanks very much wonderful talk <laughs>